Good afternoon. Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Forum today. We have uh, with us a, a, a couple of special guests. Their name is Sandberg. And um, they own Granite Mill. And this business uh, started in 1907. Mm -hmm. So how many years is that? A hundred and... 107 years. Family-owned business that has succeeded as a family-owned business. Gary Sandberg is the gran uh, grandson of Frederick Sandberg. Chris is the great-grandson. And uh, Granite Mill is known for its um, expertise in the, uh, in the milling industry. They, uh, things they've done include the uh, state capital remodel, the um, uh, all kinds of chapels and, and things all over the world, but mostly they do stuff in the, in the West. They uh, work for the LDS Church as well as other institutions, they, uh, and they do big jobs. And um, that uh, specialization and um, the ability to produce an excellent product has kept this uh, family business going for 107 years. I've known Gary Sandberg since 1964. Right. And um, they used to call him Sequoia around the uh, fraternity house. And uh, you'll see why in a minute when he stands up. But, um, He's a great guy, and, uh, uh, and I appreciate him coming. So without uh, any further ado, let's welcome Gary Sandberg. You may not get the sequoia thing, but that's because uh, it's not my height. It's the girth of my legs. They are, they are massive. So anyway, if I, I probably don't uh, plan on falling down here because I've got pretty good stems. Um, <laughs> appreciate the introduction and um, today I want to tell you a little bit about Granite Mill and Fixture Company. We're a manufacturer of wood and wood related products which we provide primarily to the construction industry. As you sit at these desks here this morning and this kind of desk etc that you've been surrounded with throughout your, your educational careers Granite Mill has produced many of those kind of products. And we're not the only producer, but we, we do it for schools and hospitals and churches, hotels, temples, and projects such as uh, Rick mentioned. Um, we did the, the interior of the Symphony Hall in Salt Lake. And I have a list of projects that we'll get to in one of our slides. But uh, we're very honored, and I appreciate uh, being with you today. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting experience for me. Um, when you talk about a company, specifically a family business, it's not just a talk about or discussion of the business, but it's a discussion of the family. In our business, being construction related, um, there was a, an old uh, 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 list of what we called construction, glossary of construction terms. And I want, want to share those with you this morning. Uh, these are part of the challenges of being a hard bid contractor. In, in, uh, in the construction industry, we call hydroelectric construction it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> Diversification in construction is an attempt to profit by betting on every horse in the race. Doesn't work very well. Specialization is an attempt uh, to win by betting on the wrong horse. A contractor, uh, those that have the prime contract, and many of you maybe have uh, experience with construction, but a contractor is defined as a gambler who never gets to shuffle, cut, or deal. 
And one step down from them is us, a subcontractor, a gambler who never gets to shuffle, cut, deal, or see the other players' hands. We don't know who, who we're bidding against, and often we don't even know how our bid turned out. Uh, bid opening is a poker game in which the losing hand wins. <laughs> a bid is a wild guess carried out into two decimal places. Hopefully that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. A low bidder is a contractor who is wondering what he left out. I see a, a nod, so Joy, you must have been involved in some construction here. I, um, my husband is yeah, okay. An engineer's estimate is defined as the cost of construction in heaven. They never, they never match what reality is, folks. A uh, project man manager is the con conductor of an orchestra in which every mus musician is in a different union. Truth to that. The critical path method is a management technique for losing your shirt under perfect control. And a strike is an, <laughs> is an effort to increase egg production by strangling the chicken. <laughs> and finally, a delayed payment is defined, and we all know what this is, is a, is a tourniquet applied to the pocketbook. Anyway, although these are meant to be tongue in cheek, uh, these definitions uh, are very close to the mark too often. Like all businesses, there are significant risks associated with our industry. It requires a good deal of hard work, optimism, courage, and skill, and often some good luck for a company to work and make it for four generations. We feel grateful and, and very honored that we have been able to, to uh, survive and prosper during the last 107 years. Today I want to tell you about that history of Granite Mill and the individuals who have made it happen and one of the oldest family-owned businesses in the state of Utah. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather, the founder of Granite Mill, Frederick Sandberg and his family. Now, I, I wanna do a little bit deeper background. This is my grandmother, Ellen. Both, both Fred, Frederick and Ellen were immigrants from Sweden. When they arrived in the United States, my, grandma, my grandmother was 16 years old, came by herself, and my grandfather, who arrived in, in uh, uh, Salt, Lake, Salt Lake in 1886, um, had just been a student of English, uh, but he had served a mission to the LDS Church. He joined the LDS Church in uh, 1880, or excuse me, 18, uh, 1862. Um, and he arrived from Ekra, Sweden, which is a suburb of Stockholm, uh, in 1886 at age 21. As part of, and he was part of the perpetual immigration program that was sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At 19, he was called from the audience, like you, to serve a mission after being a member of the church for four or five years. And he did, he did so, served two, for two years in Sweden and Finland, and was one of the first four missionaries ever to enter the country of Finland. Frederick was a fast learner, and uh, prior to his mission, he had been trained and was training as a, as a cabinet maker, a Finnish carpenter, and a stair builder, which were all very unique and very highly skilled crafts. Frederick was, uh, in fact, uh, renowned and became known for his high quality standards. He had great attention to detail. During his mission, he also, as I mentioned, he learned to read English and, and write English, which came in handy when he arrived in the United States. He also kept faithfully, every day, a journal. And I have, I have his original missionary journals that he wrote in, in 1884 to 1886. This is a, a sample, and I think it's interesting uh, I don't know how many of you keep journals. I, I keep something of a journal on a, not a, uh, as disciplined a basis as he did, but every day he made an entry. And this is an example of his handwriting. 
um, as you can see by his handwriting, his attention to detail was remarkable. Um, often, when as a missionary, the days were long, uh, often including uh, 10 to 15 mile of walking in Swedish winters, and after which he would conduct meetings in ta various towns. That discipline and that uh, uh, that it was part of his character throughout his life. Um, I might add that in Sweden, in the middle of winter, uh, I don't know how many of you have been watching the Olympics, but uh, Sweden is probably about another six or 700 miles north of uh, Sochi, uh, Russia, which is kind of having a heat wave right now. They didn't have that benefit. 40 below zero temperatures are commonplace in Sweden. And if you're walking in 40 below zero temperatures, you know you've, uh, you know you've had a, a, a tough day and a tough go of it. When Frederick arrived in Salt Lake City, he immediately began looking for a job as a Finnish carpenter and stair builder. There just so happened to be a small project going on in Salt Lake at that time. And during the next six years, he was hired on to work for a Salt Lake company called Salt Lake Building and Manufacturing to do the interior finish work in the Salt Lake Temple. So this was, this was like uh, a, one of, as I mentioned, good luck uh, is often necessary. This was a fortuitous situation for him, but there was a, he, he had a skill set that was needed and that was part of his, his uh, working career from the time he arrived in the United States until six years thereafter. Um, that that uh, project was finished in 1892, but prior to that, in 1888, Frederick married uh, another Swedish, his first, uh, his first wife was named Hannah Hoagland, also a Swedish immigrant. They were married in the Logan Temple. Together they had six children, and with that large family, uh, he needed to find work, uh, which he did as a private contractor in and around Salt Lake, building homes and doing interior wood finishes. Uh, Hannah passed away in, in 1913. And the first slide I showed you was the slide of my, my grandmother, which was my, my grandfather's second wife. And at that time, my grandfather was 53 years old. My, my father was the first of the second family, and he had five brothers and sisters after he was born in 1918. So my grandfather, at 53, basically started all over again as a, with a second family. Um, but in 1903, there was a company starting up in uh, the southeast part of Salt Lake. At that time, it was referred to as granite because that is the area where the large blocks of granite were brought down out of, Mill Cre out of uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon that had been hewn out of the, quarried out of the walls of that canyon and brought to that portion, now known as Sugar House, but uh, at that point, they were, they were uh, hewn down and sized so that they could be taken to Temple Square to be fit in the walls of the Salt Lake Temple. But in 1903, and that's just a little bit about Sugar House, but in 1903, this new shop, this new company was starting in Sugar House. My f grandfather got a job at, at Granite Planing Mill as a working foreman. But in 1907, and I, there's, a, there's a little picture of this, but in 1909, excuse me, in 1909, um, there was a fire that basically totally uh, destroyed Granite Planing Mill. And company um, legend has it that the owners and, and people that worked at Granite Planing Mill decided, well, we don't have enough money to get out of town, so we better rebuild it and start again, which they did. And in 1909, Granite Mill was uh, founded with my, my grandfather as the manager and uh, a partner in, in the ownership of the business. 
um, with W.H. Allington as the president and W.H. Bennett as treasurer. The Bennetts were part of the Bennett paint family, so there was an, a kind of a close relationship uh, there for many, many years. These founders would probably be pleased, and I would guess not a little bit surprised to see the company still around and that humble enterprise 100 years, 107 years later. <coughs> Excuse me. Despite two world wars, the Great Depression, the company managed to survive and prosper. In reading the board minutes from 1929 and 30, one of the entries uh, reads, quote, due to difficult uh, financial circumstances, a 10% reduction in wages will, be, will commence immediately. Two months later, an additional 5% cut was taken across the board for everyone, including the owners of the business. <clears throat> but that may not sound too strange to some of us that have weathered the last five years of economics here in the United States. I mean, I think there, there are times you'll see cycles, and we have been exposed to a cycle here over the last four or five years, particularly in construction. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the harsh realities that were part of life then and now. They are, they are realities of small business that you have to be prepared to weather. And it is no small thing to, to uh, realize and do that preparation because when the time comes, you need to have that in place. About 70%, you, you probably are all aware of this, about 70% of all private sector jobs in the United States are provided by small business and by entrepreneurial individuals like yourselves. We're the, they're the ones, we're the ones that create these jobs. Uh, but these are the challenges that we face uh, of owning your own business uh, each year. The reality of a small, closely held business is you own, own the business, but you also own 100% of the risk involved. And I think that one of the uh, comments that I would make is, you not only own the business, but you are part of, and to some degree, the business owns you. And I, I made a comment to my son that, that, uh, that uh, that's how I feel sometimes. The business owns me. Uh, I have to do what it, what it dictates has to be done. And, but I would also say that the positive, I wouldn't have it any other way, because the positive side of this is it gives fulfillment and direction and a sense of accomplishment when we see the work that we're able to accomplish and, and bring about uh, beautiful interiors of, of buildings throughout the, the entire West. And we've done work in, in Aba, Nigeria, and Ghana, in Saudi Arabia, Hawaii, uh, and many, many projects throughout the, the world, and we're very honored to be chosen because we really are chosen. We're invited to bid on these projects because they've seen our work, they feel like they have confidence that we can pr perform the work involved. Um, Frederick Sandberg certainly knew the importance of waking up, and I wanted to read this little thing. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle awakes and knows he better start running or he will be eaten. Every morning in Africa, a lion awakes and knows he better start running or he, w or he will starve. So whether you're a lion or a gazelle or a small businessman, when you wake up, you better start running or you will in fact be eaten. And I would say that Frederick Sandberg certainly knew that as, a, as an immigrant from Sweden with, with very little money, if any, uh, he knew the importance of waking up and running hard every day. Another important lesson for family business is a transition in leadership. This is an area, this is a time when so many family businesses do not make it to the next generation because the preparation has not been done. 45, 44 years ago, after finishing at the University of Utah with Rick and others, I began full time at Granite Mill. My father, Wayne Sandberg had been president uh, of Granite Mill for 27 years at that time um, and had provided great leadership for the company. 
as an only son, working f with my father from the time I was a, a, a child was always my dream job. Uh, I have to say that, that I look back on that time and it b brought us closer together as, as a father and a son and it's one of the true blessings in my life to have had a chance to work with my father. Uh, and I know he felt the same way about his father. Um, we worked together for the next seven years and saw the business, business triple in sales and, and volume. In 1977, my father decided to go into politics and he ran for the Utah State Senate, and <coughs> which was uh, a new frontier for him, never having been involved in politics in any way before. To all of our astonishment, he won election and served uh, from 1977 and was reelected in 1982. And his foray into politics took so much of his time and required him to resign from the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And ha having been together with him for seven years, to, I think, to a great degree, help prepare me so that I could make that transition and take over, which I did. And I wanted just to, to amplify this. Uh, if you're in a business, a family business, or if you're starting a family business and want to see that transition, to fail to plan in that area is definitely planning to fail because that's where so many businesses uh, actually don't make it to the next generation. Through the years, Granite Mill has helped beautify thousands of projects from homes to symphony halls, conference centers, to courthouses and cancer hospitals. <coughs> Our portfolio of projects speaks for itself. Um, it, here's a list, the, the governor's mansion. This is actually the, um, this is the fireplace mantle uh, at the governor's mansion. This is a, a carving, this is a hand carving of Neptune. But all of this detail uh, work is on the balustrade. Uh, if you ever go to the, to the governor's mansion, you'll see this work. This is how we got it. It was all burned to cinders. And we calipered that down and had our carvers. But at the time, it was the largest carving project anywhere in the United States of America. We ended up having to hire some additional help out of California with a company that uh, uh, helped us perform that work. And I don't know, have any of you ever been to the governor's mansion? It was built as a, by a um, very successful uh, mining uh, family out of uh, Park City. And, and it was beautifully done. These were actually Botticelli carvings that were, were done inside the building. Anyway, um, another uh, instance that, that took place, if you, if you go to some of these projects, how many have been in, in, into Interior Symphony Hall? Okay, all of, these, all of this work in Symphony Hall from the proscenium and stage to the walls and, and uh, the grand entrance, that was all done uh, by Granite Mill in 1977. So we have had an opportunity to work on this kind of monumental uh, institutional type buildings that we believe are a part of the legacy of, of the state of Utah. I wanted to m mention that, um, I want to run along here, but, but the interior of this, uh, of this building, if you can see the detail where there are steps, you can kind of see it here in the ceiling, but those same steps, each one of those steps in the, in the uh, uh, element, the, the uh, final architectural element, is angled and they are all engineered by an acoustical engineer by the name of Dr. Cyril Harris to mix the, the uh, different uh, sounds from all of the different instruments uh, properly within the interior of the, of the hall. Cyril Harris was the, re was the world's renowned uh, acoustical engineer. He did Avery Fisher Hall in New York. He did the, redid the Carnegie Hall. Uh, and those, those halls 
according to Dr. Cyril Harris, are no better, if as good, as Symphony Hall in Salt Lake City. When this was originally uh, shown on the architect's drawing, these walls were, were shown to be poured as flat concrete pours. So it, without having any of those angles and elements uh, in them. We went to them and said, we can save you $250,000 worth of furring and, and blocking if you'll pour, if you'll set up your concrete pours with those elements built in, which is what they did. So that, on that project, that suggestion saved basically a quarter of a million dollars in, in work and made our job a lot easier. We still had to, we still had to fur and, and attach all of those panels to the walls, to the concrete walls. But those are the kinds of things that over the years, uh, we have some the experience to be able to help out. And that was a significant uh, uh, event in, in the time that that building was built. In uh, 1959, uh, under the leadership of my father, Wayne Sandberg, Granite Mill pioneered a new era of casework products for schools and healthcare uh, and the healthcare market with the in introduction of Granite Line. This is a product that is essentially the first in the in mountain area in the West to utilize laminate plastic in the construction of cabinetry and, and millwork. Now, the plastic laminate was used extensively in countertops, but never on cabinets. And mo I would dare say most of the of you here have been uh, uh, through high school, junior high school, elementary school, laminate plastic cabinetry is, is really the norm. But the first cabinetry in the West was produced by Granite Mill and introduced by, by that company in 1959. Um, not only the plastic laminate uh, was new, but also the construction technique, which was pioneered with, with this catalog, with this catalog of the, to, that we showed a modular, uh, did you have a slide on the module? Anyway, there was a modularity, so you could basically, uh, uh, through the catalog, order the product kind of like Legos, so that parts went together uh, uh, interchangeably. And that's really how most cabinets are, are uh, currently built, is with the modular type system. Fred Sandberg's uh, statement back in that day was, we don't do all the mill work around, we just do the best. And we feel that that's uh, part of our motto as we go forward. Quality and service have been our guiding principles for 107 years. Today, most of our projects are of a monumental and civic uh, nature. The new football complex at the University of Utah, uh, thanks to the, their joining the Pac-10, was a project we just completed in 2013, along with temples, LDS temples in Kansas City and Fort Lauderdale. We are currently uh, working on LDS temples in Fort Collins, Colorado, and Ogden, Utah. Ogden, Utah, and also one in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we also produce millwork and casework uh, uh, under contract right now for the new dental school at the University of Utah, new classroom buildings at UVU, and the Midvale Municipal Building. So what we do is not just uh, church and, and church-related uh, projects. We do a broad spectrum, and we're always grateful to have those. Um, and other projects that we've done in Salt Lake you may recognize is the Cathedral of the Madeline. That was restored some 12 or 13 years ago, and the First Presbyterian Church in so downtown Salt Lake. We consider it a great honor to be entrusted by these uh, owners and these individuals with their precious buildings to, uh, to be entrusted with the preservation of those structures. I want to talk about some lessons that we've learned over the years. Uh, with every project, we learn important lessons which 
when properly implemented, and that's a, a major thing, when properly implemented, we can make the same mistake over and over again, we don't learn much, but if we learn from those mistakes, we're prepared and, and we find that that's uh, critical to us uh, in going forward year to year. Um, that that uh, we have the insight and experience to anticipate small problems and the agility to deal with them before they become big problems. Valuable lessons can be learned from mistakes as well as successes. I'm gonna talk to you about some mistakes. Uh, they're, they're a little bit humbling to talk about, but I'm gonna talk about them anyway. A lesson learned from the early fire disaster at Granite Planing Mill was, important, was the importance of fire suppression. Back in the day, in, in the, uh, the turn of the century, sprinkling systems were not common. In fact, they were probably very uncommon, if at all, inside buildings. We lost a building here last week through arson in downtown Salt Lake. The sprinkling system uh, for that building at that point in time was only a standpipe. It had not been uh, run, through the, the pipes had not been run throughout the building yet. But, our sprinkling systems and fire suppression is a major uh, cost, but it's also a major uh, aspect to us to make sure we don't make that same mistake again. And our insurance check is always on time to our fire uh, insurance company. 25 years ago, uh, another mistake or another uh, what, uh, item that I've learned through experience, 25 years ago I was approached by the owners and president of an old line mill uh, in Logan, Utah, uh, to see if I was interested in purchasing that mill operation. After careful consideration and discussion, uh, discussion with a trusted associate who expressed interest in, in managing that operation, I purchased the assets of that company. The previous owner had major problems which led to their decision to sell the business. They had decided to stop bidding new jobs for over a year, so there was no ongoing work in place. We kept most of the long-term employees, and with a top manager in place, we sent some projects to Granite Mill for, uh, out of their backlog for production of the newly acquired business. During the next 20 years, the company prospered and produced many projects in cooperation with Granite Mill. Four years ago, I decided to begin cutting back on my daily responsibilities, and I asked my general manager at the time if he was interested in taking ownership. He laughed, he said, Gary, I'm five years older than you are, are you kidding? <laughs> and turned me down. Uh, other key employees and family members also declined uh, to take over, so I decided to sell the business. It had been a very successful business for 20, uh, 20 plus years. It, had o it owned all of its uh, uh, equipment, had a multi-million dollar backlog of orders, and the equipment was free and clear with six months of cash in the bank for working capital. In four short years, that great business closed its doors. This was just a few months ago, and it is one of the uh, saddest uh, uh, experiences of my life. I just want to, to, to see that, uh, that great business go under. But they do go under, and they do go under uh, if we don't pay attention. Um, management, management, and I emphasize management, can never become complacent, or bad things can and absolutely will happen. Like I mentioned, in that earlier slide, when you wake up each day, you better start running because even the strong can be eaten. Now the fourth generation uh, has taken over. Okay, well this is, I have, four, I have four sons, three of which have decided to go into the uh, woodworking business with me. Chris is one of my sons uh, who's here with me today. Um, but, uh, in this fourth generation, we look forward with great optimism and with the encouragement of, of others and, and uh, clients and customers, we, we feel like this has great potential for the next 107 years. Um, I, I wanna thank you for 
your time and attention and wanted to open this up if you have any questions about the, either the company or small businesses or what we've done wrong, what we've done right. Please, Melissa. Have you, since you took ownership of it, have you made any changes or put your own twist on anything or have you kept it the same as what you got? Great question. Um, one of the realities of, of all businesses is they either change and morph with, with uh, what's going on. When, we, when I started in the business, we were really doing more residential uh, type work. But as we developed the ability to do bigger projects, we, we started uh, t uh, you know, approaching that market and going after these major projects like symphony halls, like uh, colleges and universities, temples. Those projects are, are really our bread and butter now. Uh, we still do and run uh, moldings and trim and certain elements for the residential market. So we haven't, we haven't turned our back on that, but we've expanded into, into other uh, areas. We also install worldwide. Uh, we've sent uh, craftspeople to Nigeria, to Aba, Nigeria, to, to actually do build furniture and install furniture in, uh, in the temple in Aba, Nigeria, and other places. And yes, we have, to, we have to learn to, one of the things, Melissa, that, that we have to do is we have to stay current with machinery and equipment. We have to stay current with, with the technology. Uh, after I uh, got finished with my school at the U, I went down to BYU. There was a computer science class, a graduate class in computer science that expressed an interest in an outreach to business, local Salt Lake businesses to give them projects. And we took them a project to put for the first time, and this is in 1977, so this is early on. Everybody here's got laptops and computers, uh, but early on that was not the case. BYU had a computer, and as I tell you this story, it, it's, it's uh, interesting because there were three computers. We, we worked on uh, developing a catalog so we could do pricing for all of our cabinetry in, the, in that modular system. It hadn't been done in the, in the country at that point in time, to my knowledge. I sat on the board of directors of the Architectural Woodwork Institute for eight years, and there was nobody in the Architectural Woodwork Institute that had computerized um, uh, uh, pricing and estimating system. Well, we developed that system in 1977 and we used it up until, oh, about 2000. So it worked very, very well for that, those many years. That's one of the things that helped us weather a number of these storms. And staying current with machinery and equipment and the technology is critical for us. Did that answer your question? A bit, yes, yeah. Owning a family business, how is it managing family members if they're not working up to par, or you know, have you let go of family members? <laughs> we, um, I, I, uh, I have not dis disowned any of my children yet. <laughs> <laughs> the the jury's still out, but <laughs> no, there's there's. One, uh, one chose to go to law school, so we're, we're grooming him to be our, our attorney going forward. <laughs> so if I need help with the others, I can just call the lawyer son. <laughs> uh, but it's a great question, and as I, as I mentioned, that business transition, people have to, we all, all of us have to know that what we're doing is something that resonates with us. It's gotta be fun. We've gotta have something that, that makes us uh, enjoy going to work. Now we don't, doesn't mean you, you don't have days when you're going, oh, why me? But, but there are there's those days when, when it's going to be great. We're going to go make something really exciting happen today. And I, we're in that transition period. Seven years ago, my son, my oldest son came back from working in California with a general contractor. Chris came back uh, also from California working. We made it a mandate to all of our boys, they had to go work for somebody else first. And I think that was a good plan. Um, they have decided to work together 
absolutely a great question because there are issues that come up from time to time, but there's a, also a close bond that, a family bond that you know that we have each other's backs. That's the secret is if we have each other's backs. Yes. Okay, so I know family owned businesses, it, I guess it really can be good and bad. So how do people who aren't related to your family, how are they, I guess, welcomed into? Great, business? great question. I have, as our chief estimator, who is actually a contemporary with me, is, has been there, and he's a third generation uh, family, another family that's, that's been there. Although he's chosen not to be an owner, he's chosen to, to have a very key element, a very key part, and a key player in our success. He's our head estimator. He does all of the, the temples and major projects um, and has that experience. We, we cherish and, and, and see him as a, as a huge asset and resource to it, as was his father before him. And his son works there now as, a, as our chief uh, uh, designer and computer uh, person. We have, I think that if we treat one another with respect, and appreciate their skills and talents uh, appropriately and reward them appropriately, that, that has, you know, from my perspective, that is not a big problem. He's been there 42 years. Yeah, he's been there for 42 years now. Joy. Now, your family's associated or were associated with Granite Furniture, is that right? No, Granite Furniture was a totally different entity, but, but as I mentioned, that area of Salt Lake, that sugar, now is known as Sugar House, that was where they, they brought the, the granite blocks down out of, out of Big Cottonwood Canyon along Highland Drive, and they put them there so that they could uh, put size them ready to go to Temple Square. And that just got named Granite. So granite came from that area, granite uh, mill came from that area, uh, there was actually a granite tabernacle in that area, a granite stake. So anyway, but later there was a, a large sugar company that came, you and I Sugar came and built a, a, a large plant there and, and it later became morphed as Sugar House. So Gary, your, uh, your 42 year estimator uh, chose not to um, join, uh, join in the ownership, but he was given that choice, wasn't he? Absolutely. Absolutely. He, uh, that was his choice. That was his choice. He was not precluded from joining. No. In fact, I mean, to some, for some people, as I mentioned earlier, this, this uh, ownership, when we talk about it, we own a small business, but there's also a reality that a small business owns us. I mean, there are risks involved when every time we do a bid, and Joy, I don't know if your husband does uh, bids that require bonding, Anyway, every time we do a bid, if say we're doing a, 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 a hospital for the University of Utah, uh, Huntsman Cancer Hospital was a project we did. Often, they require a 100% bid bond. So what, what did that mean? So they'd require of a general contractor. The general contractor says, look, I'm, this is an $80 million or $100 million hospital, I don't have that that $100 million sitting uh, somewhere in a, an account to provide a bid bond. So they basically say to subcontractors, well, you have to take your portion of that $100 million, and in our case, it can be four or $5 million. I have to post a bond for four or $5 million that, that's backed by assets. So a bonding company will, will uh, give us a bid bond for that project that guarantees the owner and the contractor that I will complete a project. In 107 years, we've never failed to complete a project. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your attention. You've been great, and I appreciate your questions. I just want you to say, to say in parting, you got a great instructor here. He's a dear friend, and I also wanted to say Small businesses are a wonderful thing. They're the lifeblood of this country, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Thank you.
Gary was Gary was worried about not being able to present this properly. He was nervous. <laughs> Did he do a good job? And, Thank you. And one more question before you're off the hook is uh, I think we have the same philosophy that we want our sons to be better than we were, don't we? Absolutely. And Chris is, uh, Chris is attaining that, isn't he? Absolutely. Okay. They're all better educated. They're all better uh, prepared to do this than I was. Bigger, stronger, faster gazelles. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Great. One more hand for Gary Sandberg. Thank you. Thank you.